So good morning, everybody, and welcome to the 28th annual Vanier College Symposium on the Holocaust and Genocide. I'm Marley Grossman. I'm a psychology teacher here at the college, and I also coordinate the symposium. For more than two decades, Vanier College, in conjunction with the Holocaust Education and Genocide Prevention Foundation, have been the only college in Quebec to sponsor a week-long event dedicated to educating students about the Holocaust. Each year, we offer a comprehensive calendar of activities involving guest speakers, lectures, film survivor testimony, and student participation. Today is day three, um, or the start of day three, and I'd like to welcome our first speaker. Um, Dr. Rafael Cohn Almagor um, is, has his doctorate in philosophy from Oxford University. He's the professor and chair in politics at the University of Hull. He has founded several organizations, including Israel's second generation to the Holocaust and the Heroism Remembrance Organization, the University of Haifa Center for Democratic Studies, the Van Leer uh, Jerusalem Institute Medical Ethics Think Tank and University of Hull Middle East Study Group. Rafael taught at a number of universities in the United Kingdom, Israel, and the United States, including Oxford, Jerusalem, Haifa, UCLA, Johns Hopkins, and Derma in India. In 2007-2008, he was a senior fellow at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars, and in 2019, Distinguished Visiting Professor, Faculty of Laws, University College, London. Raphael is the author of more than 250 publications, including the books, The Boundary of Liberty and Tolerance in 1994, Speech, Media, and Ethics, published in 2001, The Scope of Tolerance, published in 2006, Confronting the Internet's Dark Side in 2015, and Just Reasonable Multiculturalism, which will be published shortly. Um, so Rafi and I met uh, a couple of years ago um, at a summer institute uh, on anti-Semitism at Oxford University. So I know this will be a treat <laughs> and I'd like to welcome Rafi whenever you're ready. Thank you very much, uh, Malin, for this uh, kind invitation and for the kind introduction. Um, let me go straight to, um, to my lecture. So today I'm going to speak about freedom of expression uh, versus social responsibility, Holocaust denial in Canada. I thought that uh, given that it's a Canadian audience, uh, you'd be interested to hear my reflections um, on, on the issue of Holocaust denial uh, in general and specifically um, in Canada. So the story of Holocaust denial in Canada has to do with this man, Anne Zundel, who occupied the mind and attention of many, many people for several decades until he left, uh, he left Canada. He was a factory of Holocaust denial. He was propagating and manufacturing Holocaust denial more than any other person in the world, uh, in the history of the world. First, I want to explain what do we mean by Holocaust denial and uh, why I would argue that this form of speech is a form of hate speech. And therefore, it should be treated as a special kind of expression. Let me start by saying that disputing certain historical facts is in itself not a form of hate speech or Holocaust denial. So if someone comes and says, I did some sort of research that can be verified, and according to my research, it is incorrect to say that 6 million Jews were murdered in the Holocaust. I would argue that 5 million were murdered in the Holocaust, or maybe 7 million were murdered in the Holocaust. Disputing the number, this is not Holocaust denial. We are going to verify the information, we are going to check the facts, and then we are going to make a decision. If someone says that uh, Ivan uh, Gorgio was not in Sobibo at the time that you claim that he was in Sobibo, he was actually um, sitting comfortably in his home in Kovna, again, that's something that we are going to check and verify. This is not Holocaust denial. If someone is going to dispute the number of Jews murdered in Babi Yar, this is not Holocaust denial. We simply need to go and check the numbers and verify that the data is correct. Moreover, generally speaking, people are entitled to hold and express vilifying and outrageous views. And 
Unfortunately, many of us have outrageous views. Uh, many of us voice our dislike of certain people. We use derogatory words sometimes, and we use discriminatory adjective against others. This is not a form of hate speech and certainly not a form of Holocaust denial. We do not enjoy this kind of expressions. We feel that it is wrong. We feel sometimes outraged when we confront such statements. Um, but still, we as liberals, we believe that this form of expression, how terrible they are, they're still shielded under the free speech principle. The way to fight against such discriminating and damaging opinions is by more speech, not by silencing and censoring speech. This indeed is the essence of tolerance. Tolerance is not about oh, how beautiful you are today, or you have a lovely hat, or you prepare for us an incredible meal. Uh, tolerance doesn't deal with pleasantries. Tolerance is about speech that outrage you, and then it stretches um, our ability uh, to tolerate, to accept, or at least to acknowledge such utterances. All this is not Holocaust denial. So what is it? Why Holocaust denial is so problematic? What makes it a special form of speech that I, for one, find extremely problematic and um, regard this as a form of hate speech? Whether hate speech would be allowed is a contested issue that I'm not going to discuss now. You just cross the border, you go to the United States, as, as you may know, the First Amendment shields uh, hate speech. But many countries do not, including England, for instance. Uh, we don't believe that hate speech is uh, a, a protected speech. So why Holocaust denial is a form of hate speech and why it is a special category of speech? Well, Holocaust denial speaks of an international Jewish conspiracy designed to blackmail Germany and other nations to exploit others in order to establish the state of Israel. According to Holocaust denials, Jews conspired to create an ox, uh, the greatest fabrication story of all times. They claimed that Adolf Hitler never plan a genocide for the Jews. What he wanted in essence is to throw them out of Europe, somewhere in Madagascar or whatever, but he didn't want to kill them. It's not true that there was a Vanze uh, summit in which uh, there was a plan, designated plan to clean entire Europe of the Jews. This is simply incorrect. Of course, no gas chambers ever existed, so claimed the Holocaust denier. That's the invention of Jews in order to dramatize the mere fact that in every war there are casualties. And, that, and World War II is no exception. In every war you see that civilians, innocent civilians die. And it happens also in World War II. Yes, it is true that some of the civilians were Jews, but it's also true that many of them were Germans and Italians and Japanese and American and British, many people died. But there's nothing that make the Jews special uh, in being killed in, in World War II. And also bear in mind that people of other religions, of course, died as well. According to Holocaust denial, the Holocaust is the product of partisan Jewish interests serving Jewish greed and hunger for power. And some Jews even went to the extra mile as part of this fabrication. And they carved numbers on their hands, claiming the Nazis wanted to de diminish their personalities, who they are, and call them by numbers. And then these people spread atrocious, malicious, false stories about so-called gas chambers and extermination machinery, extermination camps that actually never existed, so claim Holocaust denial. So it is not Germany that acted in a criminal way during World War II. Instead, the greatest criminals are the Jews. The Jews are so evil 
that they invented this horrific story in order to gain support around the world and extort money from Germany. And for the extortion and fabrication for creating the greatest conspiracy of all times, they deserve punishment, possibly even death. So this is where the circle is closed. And they said, there was no Holocaust. The Jews invented it. They deserve punishment. Maybe they deserved truly Holocaust now because of the demonic and crooked uh, ability to twist the facts and to speak about this unbelievable tragedy that is in fact only in their own eyes, but never existed in reality. This is Holocaust denial. And once you hear such an expression, you can understand how ho horrifying this kind of speech is, especially for Holocaust survivor. But any person who knows some sort of history, who understand history, just understand how vile and how vicious these claims are. So no basis in reality, so outstretched, so vile and so hateful. I would like to define Holocaust denial as propaganda that seeks to deny the reality of the Holocaust, the systematic mass murder of 6 million Jews and millions of others deemed inferior by the Nazi regime. And hate speech is defined as a bias, motivated, hostile, malicious speech aimed at a person or a group of people because of some of the actual or perceived innate characteristics. Hate speech expresses discriminatory, intimidating, disapproving, antagonistic, and or prejudicial attitudes toward those characteristics which include sex, race, religion, ethnicity, color, national origin, disability, and sexual orientation. Hate speech is aimed to injure, dehumanize, harass, intimidate, debase, degrade, and victimize the targeted groups and to foment insensitivity and brutality against them. Because a lot of this is done on the internet, hate, hate internet sites is defined as a site that carries hateful messages in any form of textual, visual, or audio-based rhetoric. Going back to Ernest Zundo. So this factory, one-man factory of Holocaust denial, one of the pamphlets that he produced was titled Did Six Mill Really Died, in which he refuted the Holocaust. This infuriated many people in, in Canada who decided to come together and to file a lawsuit against him. And he was found guilty in the first instance. However, he appealed all the way to the Canadian Supreme Court that reversed the judgment, declaring that the clause, the law upon which uh, Zundel was found guilty, which is called the false news law, meaning that he was disputing false news, was unconstitutional against the Charter of Rights. As a result of that, uh, he was uh, found innocent and the false news clause was struck down as unconstitutional. Then he moved on as the internet became um, um, commercialized and popularized. Later on, he moved his activities to the internet and he disseminated all cause denial and hate speech through the internet. And then the, there was another legal battle uh, happening in 1996, where the Canadian Human Rights Commission opened um, another legal battle for his dissemination of Holocaust denial. The site was called the Zundel site. It was a very elaborate site in which he propagated Holocaust denial. And the idea or the claim behind the lawsuit against him this time, that he contravened the Telecommunication Act of Canada that he, by disseminated Holocaust denial, a form of hate speech, he caused repeated telephonic communication that was likely to expose Jews to hatred or contempt. For his defense, Anna Zundel argued that the Zundel site was not situated in Toronto, where he resided, but actually in the United States, in California. And therefore, he is not liable for this. It was not operated by him. It was not dis distributed by him. It was done by a woman called Ingrid Rimland from the United States. 
and therefore he should not be hold, held accountable for this. I should mention that Ingrid Wimland uh, was his partner and later he married her. That's a, just a small detail. Anyway, um, the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal ordered that Zundel and any other individuals who act uh, in concert with him cease the discriminatory practice of communicating telephonically or causing to be communicated telephonically by means of the facilities of telecommunication because this is going to violate the Telecommunication Act of Canada. It's not important where the site resides or registered. It is important where the person who is in responsible for this uh, content is, and he was certainly in Toronto. Throughout this ordeal of uh, 20, 30 years of battles against N. Zundel, Zundel presented himself as a champion of free expression. He is fighting for the right, his right to voice his opinions. It is his right to say that Auschwitz was like a country club. It is his right to claim that Holocaust did not exist because this is what he strongly believed. If you believe differently, okay, argue with me, but don't silence me. And he used to stage events. He will come to the court one time carrying a cross, depicting himself as the new Jesus, fighting for justice, fighting for truth. And the media just swallowed that and gave him a stage to propagate his ideas. So newspapers in Canada at that time would simply quote him or other experts so-called that he invited to testify on his behalf. Quotes like, women dined and, and danced in Auschwitz, that no gas chambers ever existed, that he found no scientific evidence of Holocaust missing gassing of people. He sent Fred Leuchter, an expert on gassing people, to Auschwitz to find traces of gas, and he could not find any. Small fact is that gas evaporates within, you know, a very small amount of time, and it's going to, not going to last for years, but that's just a small detail. And again, people died in World War II, some were Germans, some were Jews, there was no Holocaust. I would look, like also to mention one story that involved this lady Holocaust survivor, Sabina Citron. When one of the trials was held, CBC decided to um, have a radio show in which people can call in and ask expert questions about the trial. And they invited uh, Sibona Citron, who was very active in the Jewish circles in Canada at that time. And uh, Ms. Citron agreed to come to the rest radio studio on the premise that Zundel is not going to be there, that she's not going to argue with him, that he, she's going to be alone in the room, and uh, there's not going to be debate with, with Anna Zundel. She said, I'm not going to debate the fact that I survived the Holocaust with anybody. And uh, she received this pledge from the CBC. She came to the CBC studio only to her horror to find that, Hel that Anna Zundel is going to be in the program as well. Not together, but one after the other. Not in the same room, but still having exactly the same amount of time for Holocaust survivor and Holocaust denial. I met her a few years later. She was still under the trauma. So we are facing ethical dilemmas for us to ponder. I'm not going to answer these dilemmas now, but I want you, I will invite you to ponder these dilemmas. Is there room to ban Holocaust denial, track such, did six, will, six million people really die? How should the media cover people like Zundel who aim to manipulate their outlets? And was the CBC right in trying to be so-called objective about the issue at hand and in attempting to balance between the Holocaust survivor and Holocaust denier? After more than four decades in Canada, um, in which he tried to gain uh, unsuccessfully Canadian citizenship, Zundel had enough. He felt that he was harassed by the Canadian authorities so in February 2001, he specced his staff and he moved to California where he united and then married Ingrid Rimland. On February 5th, 2003, he was arrested by the American authorities 
because they inquired about his visa application and found out that he lied or hide certain evidence from them when he was granted a visa. Upon this premise, it was decided to deport him, deport him back to Canada, where he stayed there for two years when the Canadian were contemplating what to do with him. He was in solitary confinement, and then it was decided to deport him to Germany. In Germany, Holocaust denial is uh, a crime. You cannot deny the Holocaust in, in Germany for obvious reasons. So in March 2005, he was deported in, in, in to Germany. And in 2007, the German authorities convicted him of 14 counts of inciting hatred, which includes Holocaust denial. The German Constitutional Court ruled explicitly that you cannot propagate the Auschwitz lie. Zundel sat in jail for three years uh, until 2010, and he died in August 2017. I come to the conclusion. When we are tackling Holocaust denial, we have to look closely. What are the professional standards we have to abide by? And decide for ourselves, what is more important, the ratings or abiding by certain professional and ethical standards? With regard to the internet, Google should continue to ensure that when one looks for Holocaust, the results do not include Holocaust denial. People, some people, especially young people, tend to think that if there is a group of people who argue the Holocaust did not exist, another group of people that argue the Holocaust did exist, possibly the truth is somewhere in the middle. And this kind of logical assumption is correct in many instances, but is utterly false when it comes to the Holocaust. And therefore, it's incumbent of on, on us, on people like Marlin and others who care about this, to make sure that people remember that there was Holocaust. As the number of Holocaust survivors is becoming smaller and smaller, and Holocaust is becoming just a fact, a historical fact, there's no doubt in my mind there'll be enough people who are going to try to continuously refute in the Holocaust. So we must make sure that the Holocaust is remembered as it was and not as it is depicted by deniers. It is the responsibility of the media to expose hate. And it is the responsibility of internet intermediaries or Facebook and the likes to ensure they do not provide platform to hate speech against their own codes of conduct. And Holocaust denial, as I said, is a form of hate speech. Thank you. Thank you, Rafi, for those important words. Um, I do have a, a one comment and one question. So I'm going to start with the question. Um, so, so we know that Holocaust denial has been taken down. Um, their pages have been taken down by Facebook and by Twitter. That was announced maybe a couple of weeks ago. Um, but there's still other places like YouTube where Holocaust denial is still flourishing. So the question is, um, can you speak to the big tech executives um, and, and what they should be doing moving forward? I have to say that I, I published about these things uh, for many, many years um, and spoke with people in Facebook and in Google about these things. And it was uh, sort of a parallel futile discussion for many years. We just parallelized. Uh, I will speak about uh, uh, the responsibilities and I'll speak about hate and they will speak about freedom of speech and that you contest uh, speech with more speech. So I was utterly de de delighted, uh, probably because of the wrong reasons, because many um, advertisers pulled out the advertisements from Facebook. That's the reason I think that brought Facebook on, to its knees to, to, to tackle the issue. But still, I'm, I'm delighted with the, with the fact that all the Facebook is taking this issue. Uh, better late than never. It is true that Holocaust denial still exists in many, many parts of the internet. What I would like these internet intermediaries to examine for themselves, I don't have to do that, they have to do it themselves. They, each one of them have a code of conduct. They just have to, to look closely whether their code of conduct 
allows this kind of expression. For many years, Mark Zuckerberg thought, uh, maybe now he changed his mind, I don't know, but for many years he thought and said, and his people told me, for him, Holocaust denial was not hate speech. It was, you know, like refuting any artifact. So, so what? It's not a big deal. He never recognized that it's a form of hate speech. This is why I devoted so much of my time to explain why it is a form of hate speech, because hate speech is not allowed on this platform. So if I'm going to make the connection, and recognize that Holocaust denial is a form of hate speech, then they themselves are going to come to the conclusion that should not entertain such speech on their platforms, because what they propagate is racism, is anti-Semitism, is hatred, that is not justified. Okay, very true. Um, yesterday, just, uh, um, I don't know if you saw it, but there was an inter-parliamentary um, session last night uh, from the, there was a Canadian government, the US government, the Australian government, um, who got together to try and tackle the issues of anti-Semitism. Holocaust denial was brought up um, and, and Facebook and Twitter and so on were brought up. Um, and they were saying that they shouldn't abide by the same laws as journalists. Um, they are a private company um, and therefore they should, they're, they're, we, sh they, we shouldn't see them and their impartiality in the same context. That because they're a private company, we or private companies, we should be applying rules and regulations to the private company. So I thought that was an interesting point. Okay, um, okay so comment here. Um, moral equivalence and issues of the Holocaust um, are just attempts to justify denial. Maybe you can give a comment on that. Sorry, what, what was it? Uh... Oh, moral equivalence and issues of the Holocaust are just attempts to justify denial. Do you... I don't understand the question. What is moral equivalence? Um, moral equivalence, um, Lisa, maybe you can elaborate uh, on that. What... I'll, let her, uh, I'll let her type in. Oh, she says, speaking about the CBC trying to be objective. Okay, so she's basically saying that CBC um, in their, in their um, they think that they should be objective and therefore carry both sides uh, yeah. to be more well, equivalent. Well, you know, this episode of, of um, Sabina Citron and um, and Anna Zundel, I find it very, very distressing. <clears throat> I can't imagine that the CBC people in their wisdom thought that it is appropriate to for for Sabina Citron to face uh, someone who claimed that she whined and dined in Auschwitz. I mean, I I I find it terribly offensive. I try to put myself in the shoes of Sabina Citron. I'd be traumatized as a result of that. And as I said, I I spoke to her. I interviewed her in two thousand and it was either seven or eight, so many years afterwards. And she was still under the impression of that affair. I mean, she was actually taking a, a lawsuit against them that never materialized, but was still pending in 2007 and eight. It was lingering there. I spoke with the legal advisor of the CBC uh, in 2007, eight, when I did research about this. And uh, he said that it was a mistake. He acknowledged that it was a mistake. Uh, you cannot pit Holocaust denial against Holocaust survivor to the same extent that you cannot pit one against the other um, a woman who was raped with a rapist or a murderer who murdered a family with a survivor of the family. I mean, this will be unacceptable. Um, it's, it's morally wrong. I understand that you as a, as a radio station would like to try and strive to be so-called objective as there is no moral compass for you to differentiate between Holocaust denial and Holocaust. Okay, so you try to say, well, let's have a platform for him. He deserves to be heard because his trial was at the same time. Okay, I can understand that, but why at the same time? Why at the same moment? Why, why you can't have Sabina Citroen one day and then uh, Ernest Zulu on another day. 
Why do you need to pit them together just to have ratings? For me, this is unacceptable. So um, when you want to be objective, there are limits to objectivity here and you should not lose your moral compass when you are pitting one against the other, something is terribly wrong. Someone who promote hate speech with someone who, who had to endure the whining and dining of Auschwitz. Okay. And lastly, only because I have to say this because I am a teacher and I see some of my students that are present. Um, what, what can students do to try and um, counter any narratives regarding Holocaust denial? First of all, remember, remember, never forget. And never allow this to happen again never again not to jews not to christians not to muslims not to sikhs not to anyone um genocide is wrong you don't kill people simply because they belong to certain nationality race or religion and study the facts and counter holocaust denial with truth give figures give data when you encounter Holocaust denial in your social networking, ask him, where do you get your figures? Where do you get your data from? I would like to know, and I'm going to contest you, and I'm going to challenge you. And don't be quiet, don't be silent when you see that, because silence empowers them. All that evil needs is for many people to stand idly by, and then evil will triumph. You have to stand against evil. You have to say this is wrong. You have to expose evil and to fight against it. That's what I would say to your student, my student, anybody. Amen. <laughs> Amen. So on that very powerful note, um, I would like to thank you, Rafi, for, for coming and, and for speaking so eloquently about such a terrible topic. So thank you again and uh, hope to see you soon. Thank you for the invitation. Take care. Bye-bye. Okay.